State University Science Festival, and I'm so pleased to be joined by Cheryl English. She's going to talk to us about gardening for the birds. She owns Black Cat Pottery and is a master gardener. So welcome, Cheryl, to the last event. Thank you, Roxanne. Appreciate the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I hope that I am able to maintain the quality of programming uh, that you have been sharing through the month for the Science Festival as the last program. So I'm here to talk about gardening for the birds and to outline some strategies for supporting our native birds and their natural communities here in Michigan. Now, although I'm a Michigan gardener and a Michigan habitat person, um, a lot of these things are going to be applicable outside of Michigan beyond, beyond the limits of our state. Um, there's a lot of sort of basic concepts and uh, strategies that will work uh, regardless of where you live. So I'm hoping this will be helpful to you even if you're not here in Michigan. So let's get started. Um, okay, make sure this is gonna work here for me. Okay, so this is, a, I've been doing some programs on, on native plants and habitat for some time. I'm also a member of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And if you're the least bit interested in native birds or habitat, it's a really wonderful organization. I really strongly suggest that you look into it. Um, and about a, a year and a half ago, uh, in their annual report issue in autumn of 2019, um, they published uh, information regarding uh, studies about our native birds. And what, what the findings have been is that we have lost 3 billion birds, 3 billion. Um, over 25% of our native birds have been lost. Um, the least affected sort of demographic uh, are the Eastern forest birds, which are down 17%. And that's pretty much where I am. Um, I'm in Detroit, so Southeast Michigan uh, would have been uh, a forest area, Lake Plain Prairie uh, before settlement by Europeans. Um, the most severely affected are the grassland birds, which are down 53%. Um, that's more characteristic probably of the Great Plains. Um, we do have tall grass prairie here in Michigan. Uh, tall grass prairie is more uh, consistent with east of the Mississippi. Uh, short grass prairie is uh, west of the Mississippi. Um, uh, talking about some of our more common backyard birds that we may know, uh, my favorites are the corvids myself, you know, myself. Um, we've lost 25% of our blue jays, for example. Uh, we've lost one in four of our rose-breasted grosbeaks. We've lost 33% of our Baltimore Orioles, our dark-eyed juncos, and our white-throated sparrows. Now, these birds are various uh, life ways. The blue jays are resident all year long. Uh, the grosbeaks, the orioles, the juncos, and the sparrows are all migrants. Some of them are tropical migrants or neotropical migrants, meaning that they travel down to Central or South America during our winter and then come back up here in the spring to have their young and raise their, 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 their babies before they go back down. Actually, they spend less of their life's annual cycle here raising their young uh, than they do in the uh, overwintering, what we consider overwintering south of us. Uh, Dark-eyed juncos uh, actually are, they nest north of here and they winter here so that they're migrants, but we are where they overwinter, okay? Um, in terms of what we're talking about habitat, in terms of an overview, there are three things that are fundamental requirements for any organism to be able to live. They are food, water, and shelter. And these are contributing to two dynamics. One is the survival of the individual. And the second is raising the next generation. Okay, so the babies. When we talk about food, we, you know, feeding, feeding the birds. Like, are you gonna feed the birds this year? Uh, what we're usually talking about is we're talking about forage for adult birds. Um, feeding the grown-ups, okay? Um, and we, we're usually talking about this in the winter. Um, but different species do rely on different sources of food as adults. 
and they may they may be seed eaters, they may be fruit eaters, they may feed on insects, they may feed on nectar. And some species are omnivorous that they may feed on certain things. They may feed on fruit during a part of the year, but they may feed on insects at other times of the year. So it has to do with availability. And these are dynamics that have evolved over time, over a long, long time. Uh, and we have disrupted these dynamics with, you know, very quickly in a very short period of time, we have impacted them profoundly. And these are a lot of the reasons why we're seeing this tremendous decline. Now we can get pushback and people will say, oh, but there, we haven't lost that many birds. There's all these other, there's a lot of birds out there. And there are a lot of birds out there. There are a lot of European starlings. There are a lot of rock pigeons. There are a lot of uh, house sparrows. These are not birds that are native here. What we're talking about is our native birds native to the Western hemisphere uh, that were here before Columbus discovered America using discovered very advisedly. Um, the thing that we don't usually talk about or hear about is providing the food for baby birds because baby birds don't necessarily eat the same stuff that their, their parents do, okay? In fact, the young of most native songbirds, regardless of what their parents are consuming, they are being raised on native insects and particularly the larvae of native butterflies and moths, caterpillars. Uh, the biggest threat to the ongoing survival of our native songbird species, especially our neotropical migrants, is access to sufficient forage to raise their young. When we talk about the neotropical migrants, <clears throat> these are birds that evolved a dynamic where they would come up here to North America, raise their young, usually maybe only one nesting cycle, maybe two depending on their timing, and then head back down south for the winter. This is a very expensive proposition. So when it evolved, it must have been very efficacious. And it was because there was tremendous food available in terms of this, uh, the, 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 the larva, the caterpillars. This is a major factor our impact on this dynamic is a major factor in our loss of our migrants. So when we talk about forage for the adult birds in, the, in an unaltered ecosystem that provided everything necessary for the native songbirds to survive and thrive throughout their annual period of residency. We had sequential flowering and fruit bearing. So not everything flowers and fruits at the same time. There is a sequence to it, and that's how the larder works. Different things come into season. Uh, different foods become available. Um, variations in arrival times for our migrants often coordinate with availability of preferred foods. We talk about um, the ruby-throated hummingbird as a native hummingbird here in Michigan. Their arrival is often key to the flowering of eastern columbine, Aquilegia canadensis which is one of their favorite nectar sources. Then there's the issue of what is desirable or less desirable in terms of food. And things that are less desirable may be eaten last, or there may be foods that over time become more desirable, berries and other fruits that maybe aren't particularly palatable uh, when they first develop, excuse me, <clears throat> but after a frost, become more valuable because the starch has been converted to sugar. So it's all this very intricate dynamic where everything is interconnected and works together. This is serviceberry that's just finished blooming here uh, in my yard anyway. Uh, it's um, called serviceberry because um, its flowering is usually perceived to coincide with the point in the year when the roads became clear. So the uh, itinerant preachers could finally make their way around to hold services, uh, services of, you know, any kind of religious services. It's also in other areas, species are called shad bush or shad blow because their flowering coincides with the running of the shad, which is a native fish in some areas. It's also called Juneberry because it, the fruit is born in June. It's a delicious fruit. It's in the rose family. Uh, so it looks a bit like a rose hip or a blueberry. And it tastes like a cross between, I would say, a raspberry and a blueberry. Makes great pie. Um, highly sought after by a lot of our native birds. Uh, our thrushes, our thrashers, and robins love them. 
Uh, and they will actually sit out on the branches waiting for the fruit to ripen. And they can tell we are, we are cued visually because we can look and see the darker fruit is, is sweeter, riper. They can tell by the turgor pressure uh, turgor pressure is like the water pressure, sort of like our blood pressure. Uh, plants have turgor pressure. Uh, they can tell by the pressure in the in the berry whether it's optimally ripe. And this is really important because you don't want to eat a fruit that is less than optimal in its nutritional value. If you have to get around by flapping your wings all day, that's a pretty expensive proposition. So you need to be getting the most calories possible for the effort you're investing uh, in your foraging. This is Sambucus canadensis uh, elderberry. This is a late, this blooms a bit later in the season. Uh, and I see a lot of nectaring activity on this. It's right by my dining room window, it's, it's cat TV. Uh, we get a lot of nectaring activity with the insects. And then when the fruit comes in these racemes, you, the way the flowers are arranged is where the, how the fruit will be arranged. The racemes of fruit are very sought after by a lot of uh, species, including cedar wax wings and robins. It's kind of funny when the fruit starts to ripen, sometimes it gets a little overripe, it's a little fermenting and the birds can get a bit intoxicated on it. Uh, and my cats are just fascinated by the activity, although I think they're starting to take it for granted. I might have to change up my game for them. So this blooms a bit later. This is maple leaf viburnum, which blooms even later and fruits even later. And again, this is the larder, the sequence of, of food availability. Um, with viburnum, you, only, you need to have two uh, viburnum plants to get fruit. Uh, they're not dioecious. It's not that you have a male and a female plant, not like uh, holly. It's that they are not self-fertile, which means it, a given plant cannot use its own pollen to fertilize its flowers to bear fruit. It must be cross-pollinated. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a different, I mean, the same, the same species. It can be a different species of viburnum. Um, uh, to, to bear that fruit and get, you know, to be pollinated successfully. Um, and sometimes this fruit can be held on quite long. You can see this is fall from the leaf color. Um, and uh, I'm going to close my door because I have it. My foster kitty is, is talking. Um, so this is a, a fruit that's held later in the season um, and fills in the later season requirements. Final fruit that I want to share with you here in this, at this point is um, black chokeberry. Uh, this is a very astringent tasting plant, the fruit, um, but it is edible. This is where you learn the difference between what's between the term edible and the term palatable. Service berries are palatable as well as edible. Black chokeberry, not so palatable, but definitely edible. And you could, if you put in enough sugar with it, you'd be fine. Uh, it, when I say astringent, it causes the same kind of dry mouth sensation as eating uh, an underripe banana. The reason the you get that effect with the banana is because the starch has not been completely converted into sugar, okay? With the black chokeberry, even though I don't find it palatable, clearly in my environment, someone does because every year uh, when this bears and the fruit becomes ripe, it gets stripped within 24 to 48 hours. I don't know who's doing it. Uh, and in fact, the first year it flowered and fruited, I was planning on trying the fruit uh, so I could share that experience uh, and waited too long and it was completely stripped the next morning. Uh, so again, even though we might not perceive it as particularly desirable, apparently someone really likes it. Uh, in terms of other uh, fruiting trees and shrubs and vines that in terms of supporting adult birds, dogwood species, including flowering dogwood, pagoda dogwood, uh, all the shrubby dogwoods, gray dogwood, uh, silky dogwood, uh, red twig dogwood. These are all really valuable plants in terms of <clears throat> fruit bearing for adult birds. Things in the rose family. We have native rose species but there's so many more plants in the rose family than you might think. Um, the native plum, Prunus americanum, uh, all of our native cherries, including choke cherry, uh, these are in the rose family and highly sought after foods. Uh, and the cherries uh, are also uh, important host plants for butterflies and moths. Um, sassafras and spicebush, these are related to one another, um, bear fruit, 
These are dioecious, meaning that you need to have a male and a female plant in order to, to get fruit bearing. Uh, sassafras is also clonal, which means you may have a stand of sassafras, but it's a single root system and you just have a bunch of stems coming off of it. I have a very young sassafras in one half of my tree lawn and I've got about four or five stems coming up throughout the tree lawn there. Um, these are also host plants for the spice bush uh, swallowtail butterfly. Uh, wild grape, moonseed vine, valuable foods there. Um, moonseed vine is toxic for humans, so do not eat. Um, it's very difficult to tell them apart once they've defoliated in the fall if the fruit has gone and dried uh, like raisins. The, the key identifier at that point is uh, grape seeds are ovoid, whereas moonseed uh, fruits uh, have seeds that are crescent shaped, hence moonseed vine. Uh, again, moonseed vine is not to uh, is toxic for humans, but it is valuable for birds. Um, also, Virginia creeper and poison ivy. These are very important habitat plants for our native birds, uh, particularly for our migrant species, because these plants are bearing late in the season. And in the case of Virginia creeper, is not utilized by mammal, mammalian species. Uh, Virginia creeper like um, shamrocks and daffodils contains oxalic acid, which is a topical and digestive irritant for mammals. We cannot digest it. We don't have the enzymes to digest it. So it causes a reaction. Um, when you see your daffodils being decapitated by squirrels and they take one bite out of it, they're trying to replace something that's missing in the environment. Uh, and the reason they're not eating them is because they contain oxalic acid. They keep trying because they have a natural optimism, I, I assume, um, but that's the reason they're not eating them. Uh, poison ivy uh, is very important. It has a white waxy fruit that's highland lipid, so highly high fat content, high caloric content, really important plant for uh, our native birds that are migrating south uh, for the winter. Another plant that you might see in the environment is something called pokeweed. It's a herbaceous plant, dies hard to the ground, has a really big tap root. Once it's established, it can be difficult to get rid of it. Um, and it, it does get dispersed pretty easily because the birds will excrete the seed. But it also, if you have, if you, if you, not, if you have an area of your yard that you're not maintaining uh, and you can afford to have this plant in, in your yard, it's actually quite ornamental uh, and the fruit is valuable. Um, in terms of uh, forbs, this is what we use to call, we, a term we use to just, uh, for herbaceous plants that are, you know, plants that are not woody, plants that die the ground every year. Uh, Rebecca laciniata, sometimes called green-headed coneflower. You can see why it's called green-headed coneflower, although it's a Rebecca, not a Nechanasia. Um, this plant is really, a, it's a big plant, um, probably seven or eight feet in my yard when it's, it's really happy. Uh, and, uh, lots of uh, pollinator activity on it when it's flowering. And it's a typical plant of the aster family, asteraceae, it used to be compositaceae, the composite flowers. You have the ray flowers here, and then these are the disc flowers. And each of these has, has an, ovoid, uh, an ovum, can bear a seed. So what we get here is sequential flowering. And so very attractive over time for the pollinators. And then you have uh, uh, the development of seed and you'll start seeing the goldfinches and the boy goldfinches are almost exactly the same yellow as the petals on the ray flowers on this plant. Um, this can be kind of aggressive. It's aggressive in my yard. Um, it's a great barrier if you want something to kind of create some privacy. This with cup plant or um, uh, Vernonia mazurica, great plants if you want to try to create a herbaceous kind of screen uh, for your yard. Also this, oh, this is cup plant, Silphium perfoliatum. This is a workhorse in terms of habitat plant. It is aggressive. Uh, it can punch through hard pan clay once established. Its roots aren't the deepest roots of any plant. This is a tall, these are tall grass prairie plants, um, but it goes down quite a fair, a fair bit into the soil. Um, my friend Don, who's taken all these beautiful photographs and let me use them for my presentations. Um, we joke about when, uh, when we have a bad drought uh, in, in the summer, we'll talk about how the cup plant is languishing and it's only nine and a half feet tall. Uh, it's gotten over 11 feet tall in my yard in a good year. Um, but this is a plant that just provides all kinds of ecological services. We have pollination 
again, like the uh, Rebecca, it is in the aster family. So you, it's a comp composite flower. So each of these little bumps here is going to be a flower that's going to bloom and then it's gonna bear seed. Uh, so the, this plant will literally be vibrating with pollinator activity when it's in flower. Then uh, as it goes to seed, it becomes very popular with the birds and even the squirrels. I open my yard to the public free of charge twice a year uh, here on the east side of Detroit, uh, usually the first Saturday after Memorial Day and then the third Saturday in August. And I timed the August tour uh, for, uh, because the squirrels start jumping around on this plant and start snapping the flowers off at the axles. Uh, and so it starts looking a bit ragged uh, after the middle of August. It also provides water. And the way it does this is that the, the, the stem of the plant is square in section, it's hollow. Uh, and the leaves clasp the stem. And the leaf pairs, they're opposite, alternate 90 degrees up and down the stem. Now there's, there's two things going on here. By doing that, the plant maximizes its capacity to photosynthesize. So the leaves are shading each other out as little as possible. That also means that the, when it rains, as it did today, thank goodness, finally, uh, the tree, the plant becomes, although this plant isn't up uh, enough, it's, 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 I don't think it's up yet. Um, it's a tall grass prairie plants. Tall grass prairie plants wake up later, woodland plants. Um, they cup the water. And so they retain that water as a source for birds and, and, other, and insects and other organisms so they can get a drink of water even after that storm has passed. I mentioned that the stems are hollow, that accommodates overwintering insects uh, in the stems. And this is why you should not cut down and chop everything up in the fall. You should leave everything up. I have not gotten out into my garden uh, as yet, uh, and I won't probably until next week. I try to wait till after the 1st of May to make sure that all of the overwintering insects and pollinators, everyone who's been sleeping in the hollow stems or attached in its chrysalis or whatever to, to other plants or other things in the environment, the things that are overwintering in the leaf litter, uh, all of those things have been able to have a chance to fully uh, make their transformation if, if that's appropriate uh, and emerge safely before I start doing anything. And I don't get rid of the leaf litter. The leaf litter never leaves. In fact, I shovel it up out of the, the, uh, the, the gutter in the, in the street and put it on my yard uh, from my oak tree. Uh, this is uh, Echinacea purpurea, purple coneflower, extirpated from Michigan. We do believe that it did exist here in, in the south, far southwest of the, the state. A nice big bumblebee there, nectaring. Uh, thank you for the visual aid there, miss. Um, important nectar plant. As it goes to seed, it's very popular with the goldfinches. And I, as I said, I don't cut anything down. So it happens over the fall and winter as these seed heads start shattering and the seed is dropping to the ground. And that's where the juncos are feeding, the dark-eyed juncos. These are not birds that get up on things to feed. They are foraging on the ground. So by leaving all these things up, that seed is dropping and they're, being, they're able to forage successfully under the plants. Uh, this is giant sunflower, Helianthus giganteus. Uh, our popular annual sunflower is not native to Michigan, it's native south of here, but we do have a number of uh, perennial sunflower species. The flowers are not as big or showy, but they're just as valuable in terms of their habitat contribution. And I do love this picture. You can really see these are the little disc flowers opening. They're just, I think they're adorable. Um, and this is another tall, tall grass prairie plant. It doesn't usually get as tall as a cup plant, but it'll get a good eight or nine feet tall when it's, when it's really happy. Um, and again, pollinator activity. And then we have seed gathering after the plant goes to seed. Some other valuable seed bearing plants that are forbs include aster species. That includes goldenrods. Goldenrods are actually in the aster family. So are liatrices. There's just a bunch of plants that are in the aster family. Pea family plants, desmodiums, that's uh, tick trefoils, chemochristos, that's partridge pea, red bud, that's cerasus. All of these are valuable plants. And they're also very valuable because leaf cutter bees like plants that have soft leaves uh, to help create their larval chambers. And I see a lot of leaf cutter bee activity on all of these plants 
Well, not so much the camacrista because the leaves are really fine. They're kind of reminiscent of a mimosa. But on the desmodium and my red bud, I see a lot of leaf cutter bee activity. Um, grasses and sedges, also really important plants for uh, foraging. Uh, sedges tend to bloom a little bit earlier. Our native grasses are late season grasses as opposed to turf grass, which is an early season grass. Uh, in terms of nut bearing plants, uh, oaks are really critical. Uh, and we have so many species native to Michigan and they're so beautiful. Uh, if you can only plant one tree on your property, plant an oak tree. And if you're going to plant an oak, I would strongly suggest uh, planting a white oak, Quercus alba. Um, they are not only really important in terms of their nut bearing capacity, which is of course utilized by everything from squirrels to blue jays, you know, everyone's, you know, there's so much forage on these guys. They're also really important host plants. They support over 500 species of Lepidopter across the country. Walnut species, including black walnut and butternut, they're not the tidiest plants. They're all, they drop a lot of material over the season. Um, so some people don't like them very much for that. Um, I, I get very cranky when people start talking about messy plants because the, I don't really perceive plants as being messy because all of their all of their stuff is biodegradable. Um, but black walnut uh, and their black walnut has a chemical in the root system that can be a deterrent to some plants thriving. It's a, a strategy called allelopathy, but there are plenty of native plants that can co coexist with black walnut. Um, and then the carrier species. In fact, one of our largest caterpillars is the hickory horn devil, which is hosting on our, our um, are hickories, including shellbark, shagbark, and pignut hickories. Pecans are hickories, but they're native south of here. Uh, I don't think any of our native hickories are as palatable as the pecans. Uh, in terms of nectar plants, some really great nectar plants are include Virginia bluebells, which are, are blooming now. Uh, Eastern columbine, I mentioned that in terms of its bloom time coinciding with the um, arrival of this ruby-throated hummingbirds here. Lanicera species, these are our native honeysuckles, not the exotic, not like the Japanese or the tartarin, which are hugely invasive and very prob problematic. We're talking our native honeysuckles, including Lanicera doyoica, which is probably my favorite, uh, beautiful coral flowers and actually very useful fruit. Uh, wild lupin, Lupinus perennis, is also, um, a, a really important host plant for the federally endangered Carner blue butterfly, which unlike the monarch butterfly, does not travel very far during its lifespan, which is part of the problem we have with the fragmentation of its habitat. Pensamen species, including hairy pensamen or pensamen hirsutus or foxglove beard tongue, uh, pensamen uh, digitalis. These are in the uh, figwort family. Uh, and uh, there are early and, and late blooming figworts, which are huge pol uh, nectar, they're like nectar machines, and, but their flowers are much smaller. If you were to look at the plants, uh, pensamins and, and uh, they're related to the figworts, you'd realize they are in the same family because the structure is exactly the same. It's just the figwort flowers are much more diminutive. So they're actually uh, designed for smaller pollinators than the pensamins. Campanulas, we have at least two campanulas that I know. Uh, these are bellflowers native to Michigan. There's Campanula americana, which is tall bellflower, which is a biennial. So that means it just has a, a leafy rosette the first year, and then it'll send up a spike of beautiful blue flowers, rather tall, three or four feet tall uh, the second year, and then it dies and the seed will set the next generation. Uh, and then also a round-leaved uh, bellflower, Campania rotundifolia, which is a smaller plant, uh, more sort of prostrate almost. Um, Lobelia, a Lobelia cardinalis, this is a cardinal flower and it's a cousin Lobelia syphilitica or great blue Lobelia, both great nectar plants for hummingbirds and other nectaring species. Monkey flower or Mimulus, I have Mimulus ringens, which uh, is right by my fountain. Uh, the Everyone just seems to love that. It's a, adorable plant. Um, three, there are two Monardas for certain that I know of are native to Michigan, Monarda fistulosa or bee balm and Monarda punctata or dotted horse mint. Um, I can't remember there's another common name. That's the one I know. 
Um, Dotted horseman's really extraordinary plants, really way cool. Uh, verbena species, uh, verbena hasta, uh, is one, and I, I can't remember the other one. Stricta, verbena stricta. Um, but, and they're adapted to different contexts. So I've had really great luck with, I think it's stricta, but don't hold me to that. But the other one, I haven't really been able to, to grow very successfully because I don't have quite the right conditions. You have different plants within the same genus that have different needs, filling niches, uh, across the uh, the ecosystem. Um, and then finally, Impatience capensis. This is our native impatience uh, called spotted jewelweed. Very late blooming, uh, unusual for its orange flowers. We don't see a lot of orange flowers. And the sap of this plant is actually uh, a treatment for um, uh, poison ivy. Poison ivy is, is, is not toxic, it has an allergen. Um, ushorial, I think it's called, it's oily. And a third of us don't have a problem with it at all. A third of us can have a mild reaction and a third of us have a very severe reaction. And this is the, this is the naturally occurring antidote to that reaction. Um, poison ivy is pretty neat. It's related to mangoes, pistachios, and cashews. There's a reason you never see cashews with, with where, how they grow there. They're always by themselves because the way they grow, the context that material is, is, has the allergen. So this is Virginia bluebells. It's blooming right now in my yard. I love how the buds are pink, but the flowers are really a true blue. And this is a plant that will bloom in the spring. It's what we call a spring ephemeral. Comes up, flowers, the leaves photosynthesize, and it's finished doing that by the time the, di di the deciduous canopy fills in. And then it goes to sleep and it completely disappears. The cabbage-like leaves are very friable and they just, you'll, unless you mark where the plant was, you'll never know where that it was there. Uh, this is the honeysuckle I was mentioning, Linicera dioica, uh, just beginning to flower. And you can see it's sequential flowering. You have a kind of a rosette of flowers. Um, the, and this always has this bract around the rosette. And then you get these wonderful fruits that are kind of um, translucent, sort of like a current uh, looking. Um, I, and I don't know that they're palatable or edible for us, but they really are beautiful. I love it. So ornamental. This is Pensamen digitalis or foxglove beard tongue. And you see these lines in here. These lines are nectar guides for the insects to find where the, the, uh, the nectar is. And they're going to push past the pollen. They have to get inside to get to the nectar. The nectaries are back here. And you have to push past the stamens with the pollen. And so when you go out again, you're covered with the pollen. So this is the trade-off, you know, if you want nectar, you have to take care of the pollination process for me. It's a, it's a, it's a bargain the plants and the insects have made. Um, card, uh, uh, Lobelia cardinalis, the um, cardinal flower, not really designed for a place for an insect to land. Uh, so it's really more designed for hummingbirds, which nectar on the wing as do our daytime, um, I don't remember what's it, the clear wing, clear wing hummingbird moth, which is the coolest thing you may ever see. It's a diurnal moth. It, it nectars during, it's active during the day and it hovers, it nectars on the wing, just like a hummingbird. It's really cool. Uh, this is the Monarda uh, punctata I mentioned, the dotted horse mint. So this is the flower here. And here, the, you know, this is where the, they're gonna nectar, the nectar is inside here. And this is the stem. And so the flower, this is the flower and the stem goes up it keeps going up and it sets another flower and it's just way, way cool. So this is the flower and these are sort of bracts around it. Okay. And this is the impatience capensis. And I, it's amazing. This is the nectaries are back here. You have to have a really long tongue and hummingbirds have really long tongues. Um, and it's this tiny little attachment here that connects it to the plant. It's fascinating how this thing is designed. It's called, these are, these plants are, the, they, the genus name comes from the fact that the, if you touch the seed pod when it's ripe, it'll just explode. Uh, it's called, that's a, a strategy, uh, a seed dispersal strategy, dehiscent seed. Uh, we see this also with uh, partridge pea and witch hazel, that this explosive uh, release of seed to try to get the genetic material out away from the parent plant. So we've talked about how we can feed the grownups. Let's talk about how we can feed the babies. And the way we do this is by providing the host plants for our native butterflies and moths. I mentioned caterpillars. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures or videos of how our native songbirds feed their babies. It's not delicate. 
Um, they bring the food in and the baby birds are, you know, I, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And the, mom, the parents just jam the food in like with a plunger effect. Okay. It's not delicate. It's not, it's, there's no nuance to it because you know what? It takes 7,500 caterpillars on average to raise a single nest of chickadees. That's, that's just when they're in the nest. They are fed after they fledge, we, but we can't track that. 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to raise a single nest of, these are not big birds. Okay. So mom and dad do not have time to, you know, feed one at a time. It's like, I got to go get another dozen caterpillars right now so I can feed everyone. So they don't waste time on, on being real delicate about it. And when I first started studying this stuff and learning about it, my understanding was that based on, you know, what I knew about monarch butterflies, which, you know, if, if anyone know, if you only know one butterfly, you probably know about the monarch butterfly, you know, it has this really critical key relationship with milkweed. And I thought that that was, you know, most of our butterflies and moths were hosting on, on, on forbs, on, on herbaceous plants like milkweeds. Uh, and some of them do, but actually most of our Lepidoptera, are, their host plants are actually woody plants. And it's 20 genera of woody plants providing forage for over 5,000 Lepidopteran species. That's just one insect classification. That's not getting into Coleoptera, which is beetles. There's, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of beetle species along, you know? Um, if you're going to plant one tree, I said, plant the white oak because it supports, you know, oaks support over 530 North American Lepid Lepidoptera species. Next after that, Willow and cherry species are kind of neck and deck neck. I think right now we we think cherries might have the edge here in terms of the number of species they they support. We keep learning. We keep finding more things, uh, and and so these numbers are going to change over time. This is the whole thing about science. Science, just because information changes, doesn't mean that they lied to you or it was wrong. It means we've learned more and we become more adept in understanding the dynamic. And this information keeps coming in. Um, so native willow, native cherry, both support over 450 species. Uh, native birch, this would be paper birch, um, river birch. Actually, river birch is not native to Michigan. It's native south of here. It's what I call near native. Uh, yellow birch, bog birch, those are native to Michigan. Over 410 North American Lepidoptera. Uh, poplar species, this includes uh, eastern cottonwood, Populus deltoides, um, Populus tremuloides, this is quaking aspen. The largest plant organism in the world, I believe, is a quaking aspen. It is like sassafras, it's a clonal plant. So one single root system supporting dozens or hundreds, I don't know, even know how many, how many trunks are coming off of this. Uh, it's, its location is kept secret to protect it. Um, big tooth aspen, another populus species. Over 350 North American lepidopters supported by poplar uh, species. Crab apple. This is a really hard plant to find. Native crab apple. Most of the crab apples people are growing are not native to Michigan. They're not native to North America. They're native to Asia, I believe. Uh, that would be my bet. Apples aren't native to North America. They're native to the Tian Shan Plateau in China. Okay. Um, but we do have a native crab apple in Michigan, uh, Malus coronary, and I actually found it for the first time last year with one of the native plant growers in, in Michigan. Uh, and I got, I was able to get two, two slips, two, two liners are really tiny, but they're, they're leafing out. I'm so excited. Uh, I can't wait for when they're big enough to have flowers because the flowers are beautiful, but this is a plant. These are plants that support over 310 North American lepidopter species. So these are just some suggestions, some idea of what you can have in your yard to support the lepidoptera. Um, now we can get back into the dozens of genera of native forbs, our herbaceous plants that provide forage. Um, our American lady butterfly, this is Vanessa virginiensis. Excuse me a moment. Oh, son, pussy toes. Um, I've grown two species of pussy toes. This is Antonaria plantaginifolia or plantain leaved pussy toes. And then um, Antonaria neglecta. That's an unfortunate name. Uh, field pussy toes, which is a really diminutive little plant. Um, the the plant the plantain leaf pussy toes maybe the leaves come up about three inches max. The uh, field pussy toes maybe two inches, really diminutive. Uh, but the 
the flowers come up above it and they're these gray, these gray flowers that kind of look like uh, a little gray kitty paw. I mean, a cat feet are so much more attractive than human feet, let's be honest. Um, pearly everlasting and sweet everlasting. Pearly everlasting is uh, perennial, sweet ever everlasting is a native annual. Eastern comma and question mark host on nettles, including false nettle and elm, one of our native trees. Um, and not just American elm, but also rock elm. Uh, great spangled fritillary butterflies host on violet species. So I, I'm on a couple of gardening pages on Facebook and there are people who are, you know, just hate their violets, can't wait to get rid of their violets. Well, violets are an important host plant for some of our most magnificent butterflies. Um, and they're green and they have pretty flowers. So what's not to like? Um, Mention the monarch butterfly. This hosts on native milkweed species. There are at least 10 species of milkweed native to Michigan. Um, probably the best known is common milkweed. Uh, also what we call now rosy milkweed, uh, butterfly weed, also purple milkweed, um, green milkweed, world milkweed. It's a wonderful range of milkweeds. And again, they're adapted to different contexts. So there's gonna be one of these plants that will grow in your yard successfully. Um, gray hair streak hosts on, hosts on bush clovers and tick trefoils. I mentioned uh, Desmodium, that's tick trefoil species. I've got a couple of those I've been working with. I, my favorite's probably showy tick trefoil, Desmodium canadense, but I also like, uh, I've been working with a little bit with uh, Desmodium marylandicum, which is a, a more diminutive woodland species, which, or actually it's, it's in prairie, but it's not as tall. Um, and there's another species that's now been changed to another genus uh, used to be called uh, Desmodium glutinosum. Dusty skippers host on big and little blue stem. These are grasses. Um, there, are, there are butterflies that host on um, dogwoods. Uh, the spring and summer azure butterflies host on dogwoods. Um, uh, 130 species host on native goldenrods. Uh, so think about having some goldenrods. There's some wonderful shade tolerant goldenrods. Um, this is a monarch butterfly. I used to raise butterflies and moths, and I decided that uh, instead to focus my efforts on uh, creating as much habitat as I could on my property um, with as much diversity as possible. So I don't raise them anymore. Um, I, I'd let them be wild. Um, but this is common milkweed with the monarch butterfly. Milkweeds are very interesting plants. They have developed a strategy to deal with nest uh, nectar robbers. So what happens when uh, a, a pollinator uh, lands on a milkweed plant uh, on a flower, the flower actually clasps the insect's leg and will not let go until the insect has done its work. Uh, if you're just gonna go after the nectar, you're not gonna get away. Um, if you do the pollination part, it'll release you. And sometimes if you come out in the morning uh, and look at your milkweed, you may see someone dangling by a leg because they didn't put out. Um, sorry, there, there's a lot of activity going on in the house. Um, so this is common milkweed. And um, this is, I mentioned spice bush. This is uh, Lindera benzoin. This is the plant that was a source for benzoin. So if you scratch the bark and, and just bruise it a little bit, you'll smell it's very spicy, hence spice bush. And this is a plant that does a lot of work too. It's, it's an early season nectar plant. Um, it's a host plant for the spice bush swallowtail butterfly. It also has beautiful on the female plants, if you have a male in context uh, and, and they get pollinated, uh, beautiful red fruit, kind of like a candy apple red, um, that if you get there, uh, they might not even ripen. I wanted to get a picture of the fruit one year. We had really heavy fruiting one year and my friend Don and I talked about it and the fruit was all harvested before it was even ripe. Um, so I guess uh, highly sought after. Um, I mentioned white oak, uh, our largest moth in North America, the Cecropia moth, um, hosts on oaks among other things. And when we talk about the host plants uh, for a given species of butterfly or moth, keep in mind that those are, that's the list of host plants that that species across its entire range has been documented utilizing as a host plant. Now, that does not mean that every single one of those plants is utilized within your ecoregion. There is variation within the population in terms of its genetic makeup and the relationships it has created. So the 
Cecropia moth may host on oak here, but it may not host on oak somewhere else in its range, okay? So keep that in mind. There is regional variation. This is Zizia aria. This is the host plant for the black swallowtail butterfly. This is one of the better known butterflies. Uh, we often find it in our, our vegetable and uh, herb gardens hosting on things like dill, fennel, parsley. These are all in the carrot family. Uh, and these are all exotic species. None of these are native to North America. This is one of the two gen genera that I know of are host plants for the black swallowtail butterfly. Zizia aria or golden alexanders. There's also Zizia apter or heart-leaved alexanders. Uh, this is found usually in uh, prairie. I see it also next to um, uh, river, uh, on river banks, et cetera. Um, the other uh, genus is um, Angelica, Angelica purpurescens, uh, which is a biennial like the, uh, I talked about that tall bellflower. So you'll have a rosette of leaves and then uh, the second year it'll send up a flower spike. Now it might not do it in two years. If it, if it doesn't have enough growth the first year, it may just leaf, it may be leaves for two years and then send up a flower stalk. The thing is if you snap off the stem of either of these plants, and if you smell it, you can smell the same alkaloids that you smell when you tear off the tops of your carrots or you chop your parsley. That alkaloid is present. And that is the reason that black swallowtail butterflies can successfully host on those exotic plants because those alkaloids are still are present in those exotic species as well. Okay, that's how this all works. Most of our native Lepidoptera cannot host on exotic plants because that character, that, that dynamic doesn't necessarily exist. Um, and by same token, there are some plants in the same family that may be utilized by a given organism, but may not be utilized by all of the organisms that are on, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say here, there's uh, something called the milkweed tussock moth. This is another insect that uh, milkweed, but it also can, host on something called dogbane, which is in the same family as milkweed. But monarch butterflies cannot host on dogbane. There's a sufficient difference in the chemistry of those plants that it cannot host on dogbane. Although I think milkweed bugs and milkweed beetles can host on both, as well as the milkweed tussock moth. Interestingly, all of these insects that are utilizing milkweed have similar color patterns. And these are, this is so to warn con potential consumers that you really don't want to eat me. Um, it may not taste good because of the uh, cardiac glycosides. They're kind of bitter tasting, but keep in mind that most birds do not have a particularly good sense of taste or smell. Birds can eat hot peppers without any problem because they don't have sense, uh, taste sense receptors for capsaicin. That's the chemical that causes, that, that has the hot taste. You won't ever see a dog eating a hot pepper because they're not that stupid. Uh, they don't like pain, so they don't do that. But birds can eat them with impunity because they can't taste that chemical, all right? So by the same token, even though uh, a monarch caterpillar may taste really nasty or a monarch butterfly may taste really nasty, that's not what causes the aversion going down the road. What causes the aversion is the cardiac glycoside, which causes the bird to vomit. It's that negative experience of vomiting that goes, oh man, I don't need to do that. It's like my dad had bad fish once and he never ate fish again, okay? It's the same thing. So that's the strategy. I'm going to make myself the same color uh, as all these other guys who feed on this stuff so that they may eat one of us, but they won't eat another one of us again because they actually learn. Um, we talked about the other things that we need to have in order to succeed, uh, to thrive we need to have a clean source of water. This is essential to all life. We should all have access to, to a clean, safe source of drinking water, regardless as to our species, where we live, what our economic status is, that should just be the case. Um, in terms of providing water for the birds, uh, you can do this by providing a bird bath. Bird baths are great. Keep in mind that birds will not get into a bird bath that is too deep for them. So you might wanna put some rocks or something in there uh, so that they have things to perch on so they, they can utilize it and feel safe and secure. Um, obviously larger birds can use larger receptacles. So your blue jays, which are pretty good sized, 
um, they can use a, a larger bird bath than maybe your little goldfinches. Um, so you might want to have varied sources. You know, a big bird bath, I have a big copper bird bath that I have a bunch of rocks from Whitefish Point in there. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, and I see a lot of the bigger birds, the robins, the blue jays using that. But I also have these little bird bowls that I will put out so the little birds can, can use those and not have to struggle with the big birds too. Um, think about bird anatomy. Unlike mammals, cats and humans and such, they, birds don't have any pads to really cling. They just have these talons, these nails. Um, so think about providing something that can that's a secure perch. I think that's not slick. The little bird baths that I make, um, they're glazed, but I also have leaves and stems on them that are just stained so that they keep the sort of rough, relatively rough, they're not slick uh, surfaces so that they can safely and securely perch uh, to, to get a drink or get a bath. Make sure you change the water frequently. Um, you might not have to dump the whole thing out, but make sure that it's getting some disturbance so that you're not getting uh, uh, and, and flushing out as much as you can. Um, and you know, I, I have the bird bath. I have a water basin that I was supposed to be using for rinsing dishes, but was was commandeered by the cats uh, in the kitchen sink. And so now every day they get a fresh basin of water and the old basin of water gets put into the bird bath. And then every week or two, I'll go in there and I'll scrub it out and make sure the allergy has gone um, and, 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 and just do that. Um, you also want to reduce mosquito uh, populations and disturbance to water. Moving water is not uh, conducive to good mosquito larva development. Um, make sure that you kind of might you know, have this in a space where there is enough clear around it that they can feel secure that there are no predators. Um, we'll get back to this a little bit later, but please keep your cats indoors. Um, they're a major vector for songbird deaths. Um, I have a Excuse me a moment. Um, I have a bur I have a fountain that has a little sort of basin in the top of it. The water comes up in the center, but there's a, a depression there. And the birds love that. And oftentimes the robins will sit with their bum on it like they're in a jacuzzi. Um, and I mentioned, okay, this is Dora. She always has to make an appearance. My kitty Dora, one of one of the seven. Um, uh, I mentioned the cup plant that can provide a short-term water source, especially for the smaller birds. Uh, in terms of shelter, there are two dynamics with shelter. Um, we have the spring and summer dynamic, which in, involves nesting, uh, accommodations to raise young. Uh, and then we have winter, which is overwintering roosting habitat. So we're there are resident birds all year long who are going to be involved in both of these dynamics. Um, um, obviously our, our neotropical migrants are not overwintering here, uh, but we do have also migrants coming from further north from the boreal forest, et cetera, uh, and the tundra that come down here. Sometimes we have eruptions of different species uh, depending on the season and the cycle and the availability of food uh, through the annual cycle further north. Um, keep in mind that uh, Different bird species use different strategies to raise their young. Um, many will, bird, uh, will build their nests in trees, and you can see the remains of those nests uh, in the fall and winter and, and early spring before the deciduous trees leaf out. Uh, and sometimes they'll come back to the same nest. It depends on the species. I got into a discussion about, uh, I make bird houses uh, in my pottery business, and someone was uh, on a page was talking about how that they don't like, they don't think bird houses are useful because bird, birds like to make their own nests. Okay. Um, some species build nests in, in trees and, and shrubs and, and on the ground, and some species build nests in cavities. And the bird houses are intended to provide habitat, nesting habitat for birds that would nest in, in cavities and trees and such. Um, Keep in mind that, as I said, different species nest at different heights and in different habitat contexts and shrubs and trees. We have an interesting dynamic that we have a red-winged blackbird pair uh, hanging around. They nested in my oak tree, which is not typical for the species, but they're adapting to what's available in the environment. I can't feed you right now, dear. Okay. Um, 
Some prefer deciduous context, some prefer evergreen cover, hummingbirds like uh, evergreen cover. Um, and as I said, some will return to the same nest year after year, um, adding to the previous structure. Some will uh, create a whole new nest. Oftentimes there is this dynamic where when, when the birds are migrating and we just came through a big migration cycle, they don't all migrate together. There is a sexual dimorphism in terms of uh, migration time. The males come, the, the older males come first, and then uh, the females, the adult females, and the, and the year, the, the last year's babies, they come later. Uh, and, and there is a pattern that's pretty consistent, but there's always this difference in arrival. And what's happening is the boys get here and they start looking for territory. They may go back to the same territory they had, this varies by species, um, or they may find a new territory. Uh, and they, depending on the species, they may start a few nests because they're trying to, you know, trying to get, you know, get the girl. Um, some species are monogamous over their lifetimes. Some are monogamous over the breeding season. Some are monogamous for the breeding cycle. There's a tremendous amount of variation there. And there's a lot of promiscuity going on. And there's also some parasitism. Uh, brown and ha brown headed cowbirds do not, uh, raise their own young. They, uh, they lay their eggs in other birds' nests and, and then they go off and do their thing. Uh, and birds have, a comp have developed uh, strategies to sort of deal with these events happening and different species have different uh, levels of parasitism happening to them. Um, I talked about um, species nesting in cavities. These include chickadees and house wrens, uh, our, our, our uh, woodpeckers uh, are and hosting it. They, they raise their young in, in cavities nests. The problem that we're running into, bluebirds as well, the problem that we're running into with human habitation is we are so keen about removing dead stuff from our landscape that we are removing the habitat required to support cavity nesting species. And there's a, se there's, there's a sequence. There, the, the original uh, organism that may create a cavity nest may not come back to that, but another species may utilize it and enlarge it. And this, it becomes, you know, it's a, there's a sequence of, of, of habitation. Um, so we're using birdhouses uh, for certain species to replace that dynamic. I had an elm tree that sprouted next to my driveway, the, just about the worst possible place to have an elm tree, but I kept it because it did give some shade to part of my house. It's a, it's a native plant, it's a host plant. It provides habitat in various ways. Um, it died back hard. It died. The, the, the plant died, uh, but it sent up another sapling, which held it in place. And I left it for a very long time until I absolutely had to take it down because it started leaning toward my house. It was actually being held up by the sapling, but it started leaning toward my house and, and toward where my service was coming in. Uh, but until that decision that had to be made, everyone used that tree. I called it the singing tree because they would get up there and they would sing their territorial songs and let everyone know that, hey, I'm here, this is my place. I, you know, Every species was doing this um, because there was nothing else around it. So that was great acoustics and great visibility because the tree was dead. Um, when we took it down, I found a lot of insect activity had occurred um, and you know, mason bees can use it to nest in. This is this is habitat. Um, so I actually kept uh, all the trunk pieces and I've scattered them through my yard to be used as nurse logs uh, and other habitat services. Um, if you can leave dead trees in the landscape until they pose a genuine risk, uh, trees are six times stronger than they need to be. So even if your tree has lost, you know, forty percent of its tissue, that doesn't mean it's at risk. If you're going to consult with someone uh, regarding the health of your tree. Be sure that you're consulting with an arborist whose agenda is preserving and whose entire business isn't built on taking stuff down. Um, because if it's a business that's all about cutting stuff down, they want to cut your tree down because they're going to make money off of that. You want to work with someone who's invested in keeping your tree alive if that is possible and if it's appropriate. Uh, so be very careful about finding a qualified arborist who wants to work with you uh, in keeping our canopy healthy and happy. Um, Birds are highly territorial and competitive within their own species and sometimes with other species. Um, and this can vary. Um, the red-winged blackbirds that were nesting in my oak tree last year were pretty chill until the fledglings 
started leaving the nest and hanging out. And then they got really aggressive and territorial. And my poor mailman, uh, I think he finally transferred because of them. Um, I actually rescued one of their babies who got injured uh, and they were not very happy with me messing with their baby, but uh, that was the only thing that I could do to make sure the baby was okay. Um, house wrens will not tolerate other house wrens nearby and they aren't very tolerant about chickadees. Black cap chickadees don't care about house wrens. So there's, there's a lot of variation. Um, it's not likely even with optimal habitat that you're going to have more than one pair of a given species in your small urban yard. Um, I don't have the right habitat for a nesting hummingbird, but I have neighbors two doors down on either side of me that do. And what happens is she nests somewhere there, but then comes to my yard to nectar and to get her babies their food. And she actually comes to my fountain and she'll act, it's the coolest thing. She hovers to drink just, just next to where the water's coming down. And then she'll perch on the edge and that's how she'll bathe as she does this incredibly quick movement, bathing, dipping her water, her head and body through the water to get a bath. It's amazing to watch. My cats don't know what to make of her because she's either a really, really, really big bug mom or she's a little tiny bird. And they're not really sure. Um, communal nesters such as purple martins are an exception where you will have multiple nests in a given area. Um, one of the reasons our Europeans, our non-native European starlings are so, so successful is because they are also communal nesters. Um, the use of birdhouses have probably, has probably saved our, our bluebirds from extirpation because of the European starling. European starling is not native here, as I said. It was introduced to, um, I think it was either 13 or 26 pairs introduced to Central Park by a very romantic person who thought it'd be really cool to have all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare here in North America. And now we have flocks of millions of individuals that are definitely invasive and negatively impacting our native bird species. Um, different species may use different accommodations for nesting. Most will build a nest of some cavity nesters. Even a peregrine falcon builds a nest. It's just pebbles, but it's a nest. Um, they need access to safe nesting materials. And different birds have different preferences as to what they will use, okay? Um, think about using organic material. Um, one of the best things you can use is animal fur or feathers. Um, you can use pet fur and feathers, but only if the animal has not been treated with any kind of pesticide, including any and all flea and tick treatments, because that stuff will kill the birds. There is this new treatment called NexGuard. It's an oral uh, flea and tick treatment for dogs. I don't think it's available for cats at this time. Um, and I'm not certain as to whether that is safe or not. I would err on the side of caution because basically what you're using is you're using a systemic pesticide um, to treat your dog. Uh, I would not use that either. Uh, my cats don't go outside. Uh, I don't use any flea or tick treatments on them. Uh, I've had a couple of flea infestations. I've gotten very good at dealing with them now. Um, my cats, three or four of them, four of them now, get brushed every day and I save that fur and I put that out for the birds. Um, and they don't have a problem with it um, being from predators because, as I said, the songbirds don't have a sense of smell. Um, you can also forage for wild animal fur. Deer fur is really great. I have friends up in the uh, UP, up in the Keweenaw, who've uh, foraged for uh, deer fur and sent it to me to use in some of my, I make a little project with all kinds of different nesting materials that I put out for the birds. Um, you can forage for pine straw, cattail fluff, ornamental grass trimmings. You can purchase excelsior, core, or mosses. Make sure that they're not treated with any kind of preservative or dyes, no, no, no chemicals. Uh, think about using natural fibers, things like wool, cotton, jute, raffia, or silk. Um, cut into small pieces so that it won't get tied up around a baby bird's neck or a baby bird's leg. Okay, you don't want that to happen. Um, do not use anything that's been treated with any kind of chemical, including the pesticides. Pesticides include insecticides. They include fungicides, <clears throat> rodenticides, and herbicides. Okay. All of this stuff is toxic for everything. It's a matter of level of exposure. It's toxic for us too. 
All right. It doesn't matter. It's a matter. We're a bigger organism, so we can handle more of it. That doesn't mean it's good for us. Okay. So don't use anything that's been treated with any kind of chemicals like this. Um, drier lint is not a good idea because it gets wet and it doesn't dry out and it can cause hypothermia. Excuse me a moment. Um, it doesn't dry out if it gets wet. And so it can cause the little birds to get hypothermia and die because they just don't, they can't, they don't have the means of keeping themselves warm yet when they're baby babies. Um, and don't use anything that's petrochemical based. Um, and you should start using, uh, providing nesting materials beginning in mid-March, not because they're necessarily gonna be using it, but they're gonna be looking for stuff. The boys are gonna be coming in and they're gonna be looking for nesting materials to make that really cool nest so that he can get the girl, okay? Um, in terms of wintertime roosting, uh, our overwintering species need roosting habitat to survive our winter conditions. Um, birds generally congregate together in protected conditions to maximize their mutual warmth. Um, bird houses are not generally used as roosting habitat, although I do know that uh, bluebirds will use it, um, but I don't think they stay around here. Uh, for the winter. I think they go south, but I've seen these really cool pictures where they will actually pile on each other, but they're all facing a different direction so that they can all breathe and they're all okay. It's pretty interesting. Um, but in most cases, birdhouses are not being used for overwintering, uh, wintertime roosting. Um, there was a picture I saw, I saw a number of times on Facebook of a, a very big tree and the entire trunk was covered with birdhouses. Okay, that might be a thing for purple martins or European starlings, but generally speaking, that's really not a thing, okay? Um, what you wanna do is provide a variety of cover. This is, a, this is an area where my property falls short and I haven't figured out how to resolve it. Um, as I mentioned before, um, I do have uh, evergreen cover uh, on either side of me, two, two, two doors down on either side of me. So although I don't have it here, it is nearby. Uh, so it's not the most egregious uh, omission. Uh, I wish I could find a way to, to, to uh, address it. And maybe I will eventually. Um, but we're talking about evergreen species. Probably the best things are arborvitaes or Thuja occidentalis. Um, and also junipers are really great. But keep in mind, if you have junipers, you wanna be careful about members of the rose family, including crabapple and quince, because there are these, these rust conditions that have two host plants uh, and they go back and forth between juniper and uh, cedar apple rust is one of them. Uh, so you might wanna be, you know, be careful about your, your plant selection, okay? Spruces, fi uh, firs and pines, um, yews. I have a, a big yew behind my garage, but it's pretty loose because of the big silver maple in my neighbor's backyard. Uh, gives it a lot of shade, so it's not very dense, so it's probably not ideal. But I do often have uh, a squirrel dray up there. Uh, you know, you'll see the big balls of leaves. That's a dray, uh, it's spelled D-R-E-Y. That's what they, the squirrels are nesting in. Um, and I've often had one up there and, and they use some pretty interesting material in making those as well. Um, in terms of final considerations, um, exterior lighting is a major environmental disruption for plants and animals okay this this um, I see it in my area my neighbors have enough exterior nighttime lighting that I don't need any um, I, I have some exterior lighting that I only use if I am you know needing to get from point A to point B and then I turn it back off again I don't even have it on a motion sensor or a, a light sensor um, <coughs> Uh, and so the thing is, your lighting choices, if you're going to have exterior lighting, your lighting choices can have really profound negative impacts on the life cycles and survival of native species. And this is not just birds, it's insects, it's mammals, it's, it's everything, okay? Um, what happens is our nocturnal species are disrupted, they're more exposed to predation, our moths are particularly at risk. We haven't been able to figure out why moths are drawn to light, but what happens is they're drawn to this exterior light at night and they exhaust themselves circling around it. And if they don't exhaust themselves, they're picked off by some other predator that can find them really easily because they're at this light. Um, blue spectrum lights are the most disruptive to sleep patterns of all organisms. This is why I have a hand towel that I put over my clock radio every night 
because for some reason, instead of having LCDs, which have red dials, which are not blue light, they're red light, um, not as disruptive, doesn't light up the entire room. If I have my clock radio on the highest of the three light settings, uh, it lights up the entire room by itself. Um, so I, I have a, I have it on the lowest setting and I cover it because I can't stand having that blue light. This is why your newest uh, cell phone, tablet, computer monitor has an automatic setting to adjust to the ambient lighting in response to these issues with uh, disruption caused by blue light because all of those devices are using blue light. Um, things that you can do to mitigate the impacts of exterior lighting is to use an appropriately calibrated motion sensor set for your human sized intruder, not for bunnies or bats. My strategy is to not do that at all. My strategy is to plant things like prickly pear cactus and prickly ash and cox for hawthorn to get people not to come back to my house again in the dark uh, because it's a bad thing to do that because you're going to put your hand on something that's going to hurt you. Um, so you want a motion sensor that's 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 set for someone who's five foot seven, not something that's that big. Um, think about using yellow bug lights instead. Um, and don't please use blue LED lights. They're the worst thing you can be doing. And they're not just bad for everyone out there. They're not good for you either. Um, final consideration, significant vectors for bird mortality. The domesticated, use that term advisedly, cat, including homed felines, as well as strays and ferals are one of the most significant vectors for avian mortality. There is some discussion as to what is the biggest thing. Um, some studies have said it's the domesticated cat. Uh, some things have said it's window strikes. Um, We're finding that turbines are not significant relative to other things. The biggest thing is habitat disruption, okay? The domesticated cat is a big factor for, for habitat disruption. Our native songbirds did not evolve with anything remotely resembling the, the domesticated cat in terms of its capacities and the range of items on the menu. Uh, the, the domesticated cat is derived from European and North African wildcats. They eat, there's a thousand things they can eat and they will eat and they are instinctual. Um, as I say, I use the term domesticated very advisedly because unlike dogs, we have not changed them particularly a lot. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that biological and behavioral that, uh, that fig figure into that. So the key thing here is keep your cat indoors always. Um, there, there have been species that have been ex rendered extinct because of a cat brought in by a human being. Um, there are studies that indicate that a single cat can kill hundreds of birds in a year and, you know, factor that up to the number of cats that are out there. Um, and work with local nonprofits to address strays and ferals in your community. I've trapped a total so far of six cats on my property. Two of them now live with me. Um, one was a feral that we, tra we trapped, neutered him, and then released him. Um, another was had been lost for two years and we found her, her owner uh, and two two others we found homes for them um, and I don't do I don't do nearly as much in terms of this as a lot of other people in my community I'm doing what I can um, but uh, this is I feel is the most humane approach is to try to work out uh, through the TNR program. Um, and what we find is by doing these TNR, pro these having these TNR programs, we over time reduce the population, um, eliminating them, euthanizing a feral colony doesn't eliminate the problem because other cats will move in. A stable feral colony will actually is more efficacious than extermination. We see this also with uh, strategies for uh, apex pred predators, including coyotes and wolves that we have these people who advocate for uh, killing them. And what happens is that just disrupts the community and actually creates more, uh, more uh, mortality. Uh, it's it's counterintuitive to how the animals function and how you actually, and the outcome you actually want to experience. 
Uh, if you're looking for native plants in Michigan, there are a few places I know of. Um, there, these are, there are more coming up, thank goodness. Um, probably the best one, I, the best type native plant nursery in Mason, Michigan. Um, they've been around for quite some time. Bill Schneider, um, uh, East Michigan Native Plants located in Durand. Uh, Hidden Savannah Nursery, my friend, um, oh, I've lost his name. Chad, thank you. Um, in Kalamazoo, he has a lot of wonderful prairie plants. He's the person I was able to get the crab apple from. Um, also the Ypsilanti Native Plant Nursery, but there are other nurseries depending on where you are. Uh, there used to be an organization called the Michigan Native Plant Producers Association, um, but they felt that they had, they were a nonprofit association and they felt that they had accomplished their goals. And so they disbanded uh, a few years ago. Uh, so they're out there. Uh, there are some really great resources for native plants. The key thing is to try to find, you want to find local genotype, because just as I said about uh, what plants, butterflies and moths are hosting on varies across their entire range. The characteristics of a plant will vary depending on where you have found it within its range. And the plants that are that evolved here in Michigan are going to be the best suited to do well here in Michigan. You also want to get something that's been open pollinated. This is the dynamic where insect pollination or, or wind pollination, it's not human assisted pollination. So we're not selecting out uh, is occurring. And this is another strategy to help maintain the highest level of genetic diversity within the species and thereby the highest level of health and potential for dealing with any diseases, viruses, bacteria, fungi, what have you that come along. Um, so local genotype, open pollinated, that's what you wanna look for. Okay. In terms of print resources, if you don't know about Douglas Talamy, he's a entomologist and ecologist professor at University of Delaware. I highly recommend that you start with this book from him. He, his work is really wonderful. Uh, I can't recommend this highly enough. Um, this came out in 2007. Um, this, he also, this is his, uh, not his newest book, Nature's Best Hope came out last year, about 15 months ago, I think, 14, 15 months ago. And this is his proposal for what he's calling the homegrown national park and how we can create a national park in our yards that is larger than the, the, the top 10 largest Natural park, national parks in the country, establishing habitat for our songbirds, our insects, and our other faunal species, and also improving our overall health and well being. A great, great book. He has a new book that's just come out about oak trees, and I haven't been able to get that yet. Can't wait to get a hold of that. Um, there are also some really great bird books. Um, let's see here. Um, Okay, trying to find the right one. Uh, George Adams, Gardening for Birds. This is another book from Timber Press, uh, like the two books by Doug Tallamy. Um, also, Birdscaping in the Midwest. This is from University of Wisconsin, uh, Mariette Nowak, uh, another great resource. Um, uh, and Natural Gardening for Birds, um, another great resource. So this is from Rodale Organic. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about poison ivy, this is a really awesome book in praise of poison ivy. Um, the secret virtue is astonishing history and dangerous lore of the world's most hated plant um, by Nita Sanchez. Uh, I learned so much about uh, poison ivy. I wasn't inimical to poison ivy before I got this book. I developed a whole more, just a whole, bunch of respect for this plant and its role in the habitat uh, and why, unless it's a problem, it, it, unless it's in a place that it's a problem, just leave it alone. Um, I have a garden that I work in in, in uh, the west side of Lansing, Michigan, and she doesn't have poison ivy growing on her property, but it does eventually occasionally crop up. And what's happening is because of the birds are eating the fruit uh, and, and we dig it out, we treat it appropriately. Uh, by digging and bagging and putting out in the garbage and, and just maintaining top quality hygiene and doing so uh, because it's not a problem um, other than that. 
Uh, there is a more wild area behind her property and there probably is poison ivy growing profusely there. But so long as we don't have it right by her property, you know, right where she's gardening, it's not an issue. Um, key thing here, do not burn it uh, because you will really hurt your lungs if you do that because the uh, chemical will go into uh, particulate form and you'll inhale it. Um, it's a plant that should be respected. Um, it has value in the landscape, in the habitat, um, and just, um, you know, I, I attended a, a webinar a few weeks ago about invasive plant, treating invasive plants, and, and just sort of uh, how strategies and identification and, and programs and this sort of thing, it's overseen by the state of Michigan and the DNR. And there are a number of people asking questions about, you know, what do we do? What do you do about poison ivy? And what do you do about violets? And the answer to both of those questions from the people running this program is we don't do anything because they are supposed to be here. Um, they are native plants. Uh, they are not invasive species. Okay. Um, if you, if you would like to get a hold of me um, you, or, or, or hear from me, you can sign up for my occasional newsletter by adding your email address and full name to the chat. Um, no, no foul, don't worry about it if you don't want to. If you want to find me on Facebook, I do have uh, my business page on Black Cat Pottery, um, which I don't just talk about my pottery. I do a lot of information about um, you know, habitat, native plants, native fauna. Um, I also, um, my newsletter posts there. So actually I just posted a newsletter a few days ago. So if you go to that page, you can see the newsletter and see if it looks like something you're interested in or not. Um, and you can, there's a subscribe button. And if you get the newsletter and you decide you don't want it, you can unsubscribe really easily. Um, I also have a, a website. And if you want to email me, you can reach me at cenglish at blackcatpottery.com. Final words. Nothing in nature occurs in isolation. Everything is interconnected. Nothing is discreet. Everything has, every action has reactions and consequences and potential. And if you plant it, they will come. I can guarantee it. Um, I've lived on my property, it'll be 26 years this June. Um, I started out with a lot of, there was a lot of turf, obviously. I tore a lot of it out. Um, and put in a lot of daylilies and hostas and stuff like that, pachysandra, rhododendron. Yeah, we tried that twice. Exotic holly. Oh my gosh. Um, and over a decade ago, I started transitioning away from exotic plants as I became more educated, and more knowledgeable and paying attention to what was and was not happening in my yard. And actually, I tore out the last bit of lawn last year and I have put in what I call uh, native plant permaculture. Uh, with things like crab apple and hawthorn, uh, bladder nut, um, uh, black currant, American hazel, thimbleberry, uh, all kinds of things that I find beautiful partly because of their function, but also because of how they look. Uh, I find them beautiful because of what they attract. Um, and two years ago, I went out to, I use a lot of the leaves from my plants in my work as a potter. And I went outside to get some leaves and in, in one square foot section of uh, my clematis, native clematis virginiana, um, which is not a really outstanding um, habitat plant, um, but it does get some pollinator activity. And in, in one square foot, in, 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 a, in one second shot, there were three different kinds of pollinators, four, four insects, three different in species, um, a wasp, a bee, and a summer azure butterfly. And every year there is more life. Uh, I see a I see a greater variety of insects. Uh, we've started getting tons of skippers. Copper skippers were were just everywhere last year. hadn't really seen them before. More variety, more diversity, and just more biomass. Every year there's more, and it's it's fascinating and amazing. And I I love sharing it. I love experiencing it. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was so informative. And I have some things to change in my own yard. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in, if you don't mind taking a few minutes to answer those. Not at all. I'd love to. 
Uh, Lisa would like to know, which is the least aggressive milkweed? Uh, that's an interesting question. And it might not be the, quite the question you wanna ask um, because the least aggressive might not be appropriate for your conditions. So, you know, I've, I've been trying to get world milkweed established in my yard and I haven't quite accomplished it yet. Um, so it's, it's not very aggressive in, it's, it's not that it's, it's not that it's not aggressive. It's not so far, I can't see it's even successful in my yard. Um, what, what I was talking, when I mentioned earlier, uh, it's going to depend on your conditions. And if you have ideal conditions, any plant could be possibly aggressive. So you want to look at what your conditions are um, and read up on the milkweed species. And as I said, there are at least 10. Um, I've worked with butterfly milkweed that wants sandy, well-drained soil. So if you have loamy, rich soil, it's not going to be happy there. Um, and do you want a plant that's unhappy or do you want a plant that's successful? Um, and, I, and I want to bring something up here that... Um, Human beings are, are really interesting organisms. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on um, and a lot of it's cultural about what, what we feel good dealing with and what we feel we don't like dealing with. And we seem to have an issue with things, uh, things that don't need our help and are successful without our assistance. We feel a great deal of accomplishment when we can get our camellia to bloom in the middle of Michigan. Uh, which it shouldn't be blooming here at all. Well, part of the reasons it's blooming here now is because of climate change. Um, but we aren't really happy with, with common milkweed because it's just so successful. It doesn't need any help at all. And it just goes everywhere. And it's you know happy as, as a pig in mud. Um, and we talk about, you know, we talk about, you know, I want to plant these things here, even though those things might not be appropriate for your context in terms of uh, your sun exposure, in terms of what you have in terms of in, in water, hydrology, um, your yard is too wet or too dry, and uh, or in terms of um, soil quality, you know, sunlight issues, water issues, soil. These are the three big things. And we keep wanting to grow things that really don't grow very well here. Uh, I told you about the rhododendron I tried twice. Yes, twice in the same spot. Rhododendrons don't want to grow in my yard. Rhododendrons don't want to grow very well in most of Michigan um, because they're not adapted to our conditions here. Um, so what you want to do is you want to look at what are your conditions and then look at the characteristics of the plants and find the one that will fit those conditions. Um, rosy milkweed, formerly known as swamp milkweed, this is a Sclepias incarnata. Um, people shy away from it. You know, first of all, try selling a plant that has a word swamp, snake, spider, wart, weed, rag in its common name. Just try selling people on that. It's a really hard task. Um, that's why we're starting to call swamp milkweed rosy milkweed because it's, it's pretty. It's a beautiful plant. You don't need to have a swamp to grow it. You need to have some fairly consistent water coming in, um, not as much as you do with marsh marigold, but you don't need to have a swamp to grow swamp milkweed. Um, so look at your conditions and then do your reading. Um, and if you're looking, I don't have the copy of the book because my artist who's working on my little free library is borrowing it. Um, William Kalina's book, uh, he used to be with the New England Wildfire Society. Um, he has three books out, uh, one on wildflowers, one on tree shrubs and vines, and another on ferns, uh, ferns, mosses, and grasses. Okay, they're great books. I don't think they're in print anymore, but you might be able to find a used copy at Better World Books or Goodreads. Um, and read, he, he, he doesn't talk about every single species in every single genus, um, but he does talk about most of them, especially in the better known genera. And milkweed, he covers pretty well, as I recall. And you can also go and look on the National Wildlife Federation has a plant finder app um, on, on, their, on their website. And you plug in your zip code and it will tell you, it will give you a list of plants. So try that and see what plants come up there. Okay. So, because you want a plant that's successful, um, that's going to be happy and it's going to thrive that you're not gonna to have to baby along and, and, and struggle with.
So you might not want something that it's, that's aggressive, but you do want something that's going to be successful. So that's what I would suggest. What's not successful in my yard may be aggressive in your yard. So I can't answer that question for your property. I can answer it for mine. World milkweed, struggling. Common milkweed, awesome. You know, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, we have another question that they want to know, how do you keep house sparrows from taking over all the bird houses? Okay, good question. Um, house sparrows are, okay. Typically what we're trying to provide habitat for with bird houses are for house, um, house wrens and um, in, in Michigan and uh, black cap chickadees. They are both smaller than house sparrows. So what I want you to do is go to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and look up stuff on birdhouses. It has to do with the size of the opening. And if the opening is too large, the house sparrows can get in there. If it's the right size, and this is something that I've, I have with the birdhouses I make as I'm learning this and all there's all sorts of things that go into making a, a, a good birdhouse. Um, if you have the, the smaller size hole, I think it's like one and an eighth or one and a quarter inch, but don't quote me on that because I can't remember for sure. I know how big it is because I use the certain hole punch for it. Um, and it's too small for the house sparrows to get into there. A couple other things that you want with the birdhouse. You want ventilation at the roof line. Not so water can come in, but you know I, I put roofs on my birdhouses and I have ventilation, usually uh, four to six holes so that there's ventilation for, for at the top, okay? You're gonna put your birdhouse, you're hanging it in shade. Do not put the birdhouse out in the middle unless it's a purple martin house. If you're trying to do a birdhouse for a house wren or, or, or chickadee, you're hanging it somewhere that's shaded, okay? Um, you want ventilation, you want drainage in the bottom so stuff can drop out, all right? You want something that has in the inside underneath where the entrance hole is, it should have been made a bit rough so that the, when the babies fledge, that it's easier for them to climb up out and get out the hole. You do not want a perch outside the hole. That makes it really easy for parasitic species and predatory species to stick their head in there and get into all kinds of trouble, okay? So no perches either, okay? Um, I think that's... It's the key thing is the right size hole so that the, the house sparrows can't get in there. Awesome, thank you. Um, then Abe, Ab wants to know, can you buy Dutchman's britches or bloodroot, do you know? Um, the, you know, I noticed that we have a hard time getting a hold of, these are spring ephemeral species. And they are a little harder to come by with some of these growers because by the time they are opening in May, a lot of these have gone by. I know that you might you might look into, um, I love both of those. Um, the Cranbrook, um, they have a, a native plant, they do a lot of native plant rescue and they might have access to those. And their plant sale is coming up next month. I don't remember the dates. And the key thing is if you um, are a member, you get access to the early shopping times. And I think they're doing it virtually that you can, you purchase the plants virtually, but you, you know, and you schedule a pickup time. And a lot of these nurseries um, are, the, the native plant nurseries I pointed out are listed. I know at least two of them are, they're, they're on people's private property. So they're not like uh, English gardens or block, you know, you can't just go there, you know, Monday through Saturday, you know, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. They have certain days that they're open and they have different protocols because of the COVID-19 situation. So what I would suggest is looking them up online or calling or emailing or what have you to find out what their protocols are. I know with Wild Type Nursery, uh, they had no shopping last year. You had to pre-order and then you set up a time to pick up your plants. This year, they're doing uh, scheduled appointments to shop um, to keep you know, numbers of people down to a safe level, you know, and keep us cycling through. Um, they don't often have these spring ephemerals. Occasionally they have, they have sometimes had blood root. I don't think I've ever seen uh, 
Dutchman's britches at wild type, but I think I've seen blood root there. Um, the other thing is just to call and find out. And sometimes they might say, we don't have it, but these people might. Um, I would love, I love Dutchman's britches. I wish I could find squirrel corn, which is the, uh, another native dicentra species that they're just, they have this lovely soft ferny foliage that, that just the foliage is pretty and the flowers are fascinating. Of course, they're, they're the dicentra family, the, the dicentra genus um, is also where we find uh, our native, not, I don't, I know if they're native to Michigan, but they're native to North America, our native um, um, bleeding hearts. And uh, De uh, Decentra eximia is one of those species. I don't know that we have any bleeding hearts here, but we have squirrel corn and Dutchman's britches. I do know um, here in the mid Michigan, Harris Nature Center is having their native plant sale Saturday. Awesome, okay. So, um, you might wanna go and check it out and talk to the grower and see if he has them. Um, it looks like we have one final question. Um, does your yard have a lot of shade? And if yes, what type of native flowers do you grow in shade? Um, parts of my yard have a lot of shade and parts of my yard do not. Um, I mentioned my neighbor who has this big, huge silver maple, which um, I've developed a great respect for silver maples because they are beautiful trees. They're just not very good urban trees, but that's not the tree's fault. Um, and I have a pin oak in my front yard that's getting bigger and bigger. You know, the thing about gardens and, 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 and plantings and habitat, they're not static. They evolve over time and you have to be willing to adjust. Um, sometimes you find some interesting things happening. Um, as my pin oak has gotten larger, I find my uh, prairie flocks um, uh, moving around out from under it. At the same time, my lead plant, Amorpha canescens, the one that's under the most shade is the most vigorous. And this is a plant that's not supposed to particularly like shade. Um, so I have a lot of shade in parts of my yard and I don't have a lot of shade in others. And I planted accordingly. Um, in shade, I have a lot of um, spring ephemerals, including trillium, uh, Jeffersonia diphylla, um, wild uh, uh, bloodroot, um, Jack in the pulpit. I have some green dragon, which is a later blooming member of the aeroid family like Jack in the pulpit. Um, uh, uh, creeping Jacob's ladder, um, uh, shooting star. That's, um, oh gosh, it's gone out of my head. Uh, I have, I work with, I've worked with over 200 species of native plants on my property. And I probably have over 200 on my property now. Um, everything from milkweeds and ferns and grasses. Um, I'm learning my grasses. I'm learning my ferns. I haven't gotten around to figuring out mosses yet. Um, but I, you know, the, the, if you want to see what I'm doing um, or, 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 you know, get an idea of uh, what can happen in, in a, this is a small yard. This is a typical urban lot is about 40 feet wide, maybe, maybe 120 feet deep. And um, I, there's no place else like it in my neighborhood, I know. Um, and I just keep trying different things. And seeing, it's like throwing, I throw the whole pot of spaghetti at the refrigerator to see what sticks. And I move things around and see if they don't work. Um, and I've, I have failed with a lot of things. But through failing, I've learned a lot about them. I would give up a tooth and I've lost, I, I had braces and I had wisdom teeth pulled. So I, 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 uh, and I had a vestigial wisdom tooth. So I actually have lost nine of my teeth. Um, I'd give another tooth if I could grow skunk cabbage on my property, but there's just no way. I can't create the specific environment that skunk cabbage absolutely must have to grow. It's coolest plant. Awesome. Um, I'd give up a tooth if I could grow that, but there's no way. I can't grow a marsh marigold because I don't have a seep that's constant and it needs constant moisture, but I can successfully grow swamp buttercup very successfully. And I do not have a swamp. Um, I'm growing all kinds of things. I have my tall grass prairie plants, including, um, 
I have the four sylphium species, including cup plant, prairie dock, rosin weed, and, um, and compass plant, which is not aggressive at all. Cup plant is aggressive, compass plant is not. Uh, I get dozens of monarch butterflies on my Missouri ironweed. Um, I learned that Agastache uh, nepito yeah, nepitoides, it's the giant yellow hyssop, is supposed to be about four feet tall. In my yard, it's about eight feet tall. So that's why you can ask me something about, but what plant would be good here? Well, this is what this plant does here. It's not doing what it's supposed to do somewhere else. It's, you know, I planted that plant in the middle ground because it was supposed to be four feet tall. No, that's gotta be in the back because it's eight feet tall in my yard. Same thing with the green headed coneflower. It's eight, nine feet tall in my yard. Okay, you have to be at the back. I thought you could be in the middle, but no, you have to be at the back. Um, it's going to, what my, my experience is uniquely mine for this property. Um, there are a lot of things that I've learned that I can share, observations that I've made, um, experiences that I've had. Will it be exactly the same for you? I can guarantee that it will not be exactly the same for you. That's the only guarantee I can give you. Anything else? I think that goes through all of our questions for the night. Thank you again for such a wonderful talk. I've learned so much and looking forward to trying out a couple of different things. I had swamp milkweed on one side of my house and regular common milkweed on the other. I don't know why one likes one side and one likes the other, but we're happy with it. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's things that we don't even understand. Um, I did, a, I did a presentation for a, a water quality nonprofit in St. Clair Shores last week. And um, we talk a lot about what happens in the spring, you know, that they get flooding in people's backyards. And the thing is the landscape that we live in, at least where I am in, in, in Southeast Michigan in the Detroit area, I am in the city of Detroit, um, is nothing like what it was 400 years ago. Um, we can see remnants of that. Um, I can go down to Elmwood Cemetery and see what the, topo the topography looked like um, back in the 17th century, the 18th century, because it's been somewhat preserved there. Um, and what's happened is we have managed this landscape into something pretty monotonous, really, when it wasn't really that monotonous. And one of the things that we've done is we've buried our waterways. Maybe not the major waterways, not the Rouge River, not the Clinton River, not the Grand River, but the tributaries leading to those major waterways. We've buried them. They are still there. They are still running through. The hydrology has not been changed. It's just been pushed down. So what happens in the spring, the Milk River and Gross Point Woods still floods and those people still get flooding because the river is still there. So on your property, you have, you have hydrology too. So on the side of your property where the, the swamp milkweed is growing, probably is a little wetter. Yeah. You have more water there. On the other side, it's a little drier. It could be because of hydrology. It could be because of the sunlight, how it's coming. Um, I have, uh, spider wart growing in the crack between my driveway and my house. My house is brick. That's the east side of the house. That spider wart blooms sooner than the spider wart anywhere else in the house in the, on the property because the heat load of the sun coming off that brick yeah. and the house never gets, you know, that never gets dead cold because it's the foundation of the house. Yeah. So that stuff comes up. And I had a clematis that I had, it's an exotic clematis on the front, front you know, corner of my house thought it died, went and got another one, planted it in another part of the house uh, in the back, which faces west. Well, that that one was always at least four weeks ahead of the one in the front because it microclimate. Yeah. There's all sorts of, that's why every, you have to look at what you're, look at what you have going on. Is it cooler here, warmer here, wetter, drier? What's the soil like? The soil in one part of your yard could be completely different from where, what it is in another part of your yard. And it's, no one's going to know that better than you. 
Um, so when people call me and ask me to come out and consult and they said, well, where should I put this? I'm like, well, you should put it someplace that's wet or you should put it place that's shady. You need, you know where that is. Right. Or you, you have a better chance of knowing where that is than I do just coming in here for, for an hour or two hours to look at your property and talk with you about what you're trying to do. Um, you know, and, and, we talk about, you know, we, I want to change the conversation. I want to change the conversation from, I want to put this in. And, you know, it's a list of 12 plants that doesn't vary from Portland, Maine to Portland, Maine, Michigan to Portland, Oregon, to what can I plant here? And having worked with 200 species or more of native plants on my property, I guarantee that I can give you a list of at least 10 or 20 that should work on your property based on whatever it is you have going on. Let's try planting according to the conditions we have, planting the things that will thrive, and in, incidentally, provide habitat and beauty with minimal care. Everyone wants the zero, the zero maintenance garden. Well, uh, even I don't have a zero maintenance garden, but I have a pretty low maintenance garden. And the way I do it is with native plants. I'm in the process now of taking out, I'll never win, but I'm taking out all, I'm working on getting rid of the exotic bulbs that I, pl I planted 20 years ago. And, you know, I see them as a problem now because they're using up nutrients that I would rather have go to my native plants to provide the biomass for the caterpillars and the, I had my first bunny in the yard today. Yay, I love the bunnies. Um, red winged blackbird, robin, goldfinch, you know? Yeah, everyone come on over here. Yeah. You're all invited. Yes. And on that note, I think we have to leave it there. But again, thank you for such a wonderful talk and inspiration. Thank so you, Roxanne. And thank you everyone else for attending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the festival and I hope that you come back to see what they plan for next year. Stay safe and well. Thank you. Everyone have a good night.